Okay, so did you um, did you manage to read this? I'm I'm zooming it. I'm zooming on it a little bit. Um, late Cenozoic uplift of mountain ranges and global climate change: chicken or egg? Mm. Does someone uh, want to to start? Don't don't hesitate. Huh, really. Nobody is going to go first. <laughs> so did you understand the, um, the starting point of the paper? Yes. So can you, can you, uh, can you say a bit in what you think? Uh, I think the uh, author mm -hmm. uh, is um, interested in uh, the, the temporal uh, correlation uh, between the um, the mountain uh, uplift and uh, the um, glaciation uh, period of the mm -hmm. Cenozoic. Okay. So what does he what does he um, what does he observe exactly? He he wants to see if it's climate change that affects the uplift or the opposite. I I didn't really. Uh... He wants to say if it's the climate change that affects the the month the uplift, or if it's an op the opposite. But actually, the opposite. Yeah. So, um, so as you as you said, uh, Betim and and um, and also Martina. Uh, you know what we can read here? Um, uh, I don't know if you see. Uh, Claire is waiting to be. To uh, join. Uh, sorry, why is it participant? Claire, admit. Okay, she should be here. Hi, Claire. Do you hear us? Claire, do you hear? Okay. So, um, but but did you understand why there would be such a link between a uh, between uplift and climate? Or between climate and uplift. I mean, what was the at the beginning of writing this paper? What was the main thinking about climate and uplift? Which one is the cause and which one is the effect? At the beginning of writing this paper, the person who wrote. So at the beginning was the uplift uh, affecting climate. Yes. And yeah. he wants to actually demonstrate the opposite. Hmm. In fact, he wants to demonstrate that actually the climate affects the uplift. Yeah, that that maybe we see uplift and maybe that's an effect of climate. Yeah. So basically uh, so it seems that from 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 reading here, uh, it seems that uh, I mean it's not very old. In fact, that we know that there was uh, continental glaciation and that the Earth was not always like this. Uh, so, at the beginning of the century, people discovered progressively that there was there had been in the past periods without ice, perhaps, and. And that we were in one of those ice house uh, periods, okay. And very quickly, people said, "Ah, but it's probably because we have we are in a period of high mountains. If we look around on the globe, we see the Himalayas, we see the Alps, we see the Pyrenees, uh, we see the Andes, we see the we see the Rocky Mountains." 
many alpine alpine style mountain ranges worldwide okay and what is an alpine uh, mountain range is uh, is a mountain range with maybe two at least kilometers of altitude and very very what he called jagged relief did you see this word j a g g e d jagged jagged relief so yeah. So that's that's the that's the thing is that everywhere you go in the mountains currently, you see you see mountains that are really uh, quite they seem recent. Okay, if you take the old concepts, if you go in the, in the Central Massif, or in the Ardennes, you know, uh, or in the Bohemian Massif, there you, see, you see hills and you see something very smooth. So this looks old. But many mountain ranges worldwide, they look recent because they are very, uh, very rough. Yeah, very, very spiky. So basically, people said, OK, this is recent. This uplift is recent. And that's what has caused glaciation for a number of reasons that are in themselves. I think they are interesting to know. Um, Uplift of large mid-latitude uh, terrain could affect the global cooling by three different physical mechanisms. Increased elevation at temporary latitude could extend the duration of the winter. And with increased duration of snow cover, the albedo should increase. You know the albedo effect? Yes. Yes. So, so a lot of the area of the Earth being white, it reflects light and, and uh, heat towards the cosmos and therefore it remains cool. Second, the increase in elevation of large regions should profoundly affect the circulation of the atmosphere. Okay, and experiments with general circulation models suggest that the presence of high terrains, especially in Central Asia and Western North America, would lead to lower global temperatures than if these areas were low. So, Global Circulation Models, GCM. This is a type of models uh, used a lot in climatology, which circulates air, moisture, temperature, heat, uh, and humidity on the globe. And so you make models and you see what happens if you don't have this relief and you realize that the Earth will be warmer if there was not so, such a relief. And finally, that's a very important one. Chemical weathering announced by the increased exposure of minerals eroded rapidly from cold high latitude and transported to warmer moisture low elevation would absorb more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, thus decreasing the natural greenhouse effect. So, you know, weathering. So, weathering um, is the dissociation of minerals under the action of water that goes in onto it, that circulates onto the surface. So you take a granite and you run water onto it and it weathers, it alterates, say alteration. Weathering, c'est l'alteration. Climatique, chimique. And basically, you know that water that falls down from uh, rain is acidic. Because in the atmosphere, water and CO2 uh, interact. And therefore, you create HCO3 uh, minus minus, something like this. So um, um, carbonic uh, acid. And so this, when this, uh, that's why with more CO2 in the atmosphere, we have more acid rains. And so um, when the rain is acidic, and it's always a little bit acidic, there is always a bit of acid uh, of, of CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, and, it, and it runs onto basement rocks, uh, basically the, the, the CO2 combines with uh, the feldspars and the calcite the magnesium, and it's going to go and create 
probably carbonates that are then precipitated in the sea. So basically, weathering is a sink. It's like when you weather granites, you sink, you, you, you suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. If you weather carbonates, it doesn't work because a carbonate has CO2 into it already embedded. So if you weather carbonate and you make carbonate with it, then your, your, your net budget is zero. But if you weather new granitic rocks, then you take off CO2 from the atmosphere, therefore you cool down the earth. Um, however, here, um, what uh, Molna argues is that many uh, or most, he says, most of the evidence that we use to infer late Cenozoic uplift could in part be a consequence of a very climate change that this supposed uplift is, that this supposed uplift is thought to have caused. So the evidence we have for thinking that there is recent uplift of mountain ranges maybe is actually an effect of climate. And so I think it's really interesting, for instance, his argument about paleobotany. Did you see that? Yeah. yeah. So basically, you say, well, I observe uh, that. Uh, um, but they also say it wasn't a good. It sorry. wasn't good to be used uh, to be used because it wasn't a good correlation. I I didn't catch it. Excuse me, Martina. So you also say that it's not good to be used because it wasn't a good correlation. Good say a lot of things. Yeah. So basically, if you have um, uh, species that show that at certain elevation, uh, so you, you find uh, colder um, species or warmer species of plants, you can infer an elevation evolution because at high altitude, it's colder. But in fact, if you just call, if you make the climate colder, then you observe colder uh, then you observe colder species. So the paleobotanical argument is, is could be circular. OK, yeah. you could mistake elevation changes for just climate change. Yeah. Um, one for sure thing that is interesting in this paper is that his first figure is the oxygen isotope record from the end of the Cretaceous down to the Playo Pleistocene. And this is the most uh, recent here. And what we see is uh, the value of delta O18 in the ocean. They go more and more positive. And when you have more and more positive delta O18, it means that you have more and more ice at the pole. So basically, you know, your O18, O16, they travel from the tropics to the poles. And O18 rains out first. So the heavier isotope goes first into the rain and goes back to the ocean. And when your cloud arrives in the pole, it's really loaded into 16, the light isotope. If it, if it gets into ice and remains ice, it never goes back to the ocean. So basically, your ocean is more and more enriched into 18, into the heavier isotope. OK, you always trap the 16 in the ice, and you keep the 18 in the ocean. So from the Maastrichtian, from the end of the Cretaceous, we see a big cooling. OK, this is surface water temperature. We go cooling and cooling and cooling. Um, So that's a general uh, thing, and it's and it's and it's a long time ago. What he explains here, I don't know if you if you if you understood this diagram. Not quite. The the point when you read papers like this um, is to to really do your best to 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 get the figures right, and in theory you should be able to um, to redraw those figures. To explain it, but I have to say this one is not so. It's actually 
supposed to be simple uh, and it uses simple concepts, but it's not so well drawn, I think. And therefore it's not fantastically clear. And also a legend like this is not fair. Normally when you write your master, you shouldn't put a legend, which is almost a page, you know, a legend mm -hmm. should be short, should be just a title and a brief explanation. But it's a trick that you can use if you don't have enough space, you put a lot in the legend. Uh, but but it's, it's difficult to, to read. But there is two lines in this, in this uh, figure, line A and line B. This is um, the crust from elevation H, top of the mountain or top. You know, it's a mount this is a mountain range. And there is probably higher peaks and lower valleys, but the mean elevation is H. Maybe in the Alps, it's maybe three kilometers or 2.5 kilometers. You know, the Mont Blanc is 4.8 and most of the little mountains are one kilometer. So maybe 2.5, three. And of course there is a route, okay, down to H, okay. Uh, the mountains have a route and they float like an iceberg in the sea. So an iceberg in the sea, you have 10 meters. If, if the iceberg is 100 meters thick, there is 10 meters out, 90 meters below water. OK? This is because the density of ice is 0.9. So 90% is in the water. For the, for the crust, it's a little bit different, but you can calculate. And here, what happens from, from here to here, this is what we don't understand, is that there is a, a time sequence here. You erode crust of thickness delta t. So you take off uh, delta t of thickness. So let's say your initial big t is 60 kilometer. Let's say you erode 10 kilometers. If you erode 10 kilometers, so you make 10 kilometers of erosion, your new H is delta T divided by six. So sorry, is H minus delta H and delta H is delta T divided by six. So let's say we erode not 10, but six kilometers. We erode six kilometers. Delta H is going to be one. And so the new H is going to be here. Let's say we add three kilometers of elevation. The new elevation is two kilometers. So you erode six kilometers, but your elevation only decreases by one kilometer. Okay. This is because it's the same on your iceberg of uh, 100 meter. You have 100 meter iceberg and the water is here. Okay, this is your iceberg and the water is here. You have 10 meters out, 90 meters below. If you erode 10 meters, clearly the iceberg goes up. So clearly you will have now maybe seven meter or eight meters out of the water and the rest below, but you don't have a zero elevation because your, your ice keeps floating, keeps going up. So it's the same for the mountains. So every kilometer down, you uh, means six times more erosion. Okay. So this is important because the new age is just slightly lower than the than the previous age compared to uh, to the to the. Uh, um, to the initial age. Now here, it's a different scenario. So there is a scenario going from here to here by erosion. Here, uh, we also erode delta T, but you, we also thicken the crust by delta T. H remains the same. So if you continue collision, and you if you erode as much as you thicken, then your elevation doesn't change. So of course, if you erode six kilometers, but you thicken the crust by six kilometers because of convergence, then your elevation remains the same because your total crustal thickness remains the same. 
Now in this second scenario here, instead of going from, from here to here by taking off boom six kilometers, instead of doing this bulk erosion, um, what Molnar says is that let's do valleys. So we are going to take off matter, but in the forms of valleys. So we can take off six kilometers, but by drawing triangles. Okay, if you do that, you're gonna have the same result. Your mean elevation is going to be one kilometer lower for every six kilometer of erosion in your valleys. But because you do valleys, your, your peaks are going to go up. So you are going to increase the elevation of the highest peaks by okay. isostatic rebound. Okay. okay. Yeah. So that's the complicated story behind this. Um, now the main, the other main, um, so the, here he speaks about geomorphology as one of the observations commonly used to infer recent uplift is the sharp incision by streams and rivers into gentle surfaces, etc. So like a rejuvenation of the landscape. But one that is very strong is sedimentation. Yeah. And this is a very important thing, um, is that in many places in the world, it appears that we have an increase in sediment delivery to the basins, an increase in mass accumulation in the oceans. So this is a, it's a bit the same as I showed you for the Alps before with the late Cenozoic increase in sediment supply, uh, except time was to the, to the right of the picture. Here time is to the left. It shows the mass of Cenozoic sediment in the, in the Gulf of Mexico and its drainage basins. But this exists also um, for the world oceans. Everywhere in the world, it seems like in the last two or five million years, we have an increase in the mass of sediment in the oceans. So this increase of the mass of sediment in the oceans, it could be the result of what? Erosion, increasing of erosion by climate change. So it could be increasing erosion by climate change. But it could also be increase of erosion by just uplift. Yeah. And in fact, uh, it's probably both. So there is no chicken and egg. They all go together uh, a little bit at the same time. There's just a balance between the two. OK. Um, so climate change and the appearance of uplift It's a tough, uh, it's a tough, uh, it's a tough and long paper. Um, but it's here. It follows that changes in mean elevation, climate change, and the phenomena commonly used to infer uplift, such as paleobotany, the geomorphology, the sedimentation rate in the oceans, are all coupled to one another. They all go together. You know, you remember the perfect gases equation? PV égal NRT in your chemistry yes. Uh, lectures. Yes. Pressure, volume, uh, N. I don't remember what is R. Number of moles. Yeah. It's in, const in constant. Constant, constant double gap. And T oh, yeah. temperature. Okay. So if you change one, you change the other to keep the balance. Basically, uh, if you change temperature in the room, it changes the pressure. Uh, if you cannot change the volume, okay? So, so it's the same for uplift, uh, climate, erosion, sedimentation rate, all of these things are coupled to one another. That's the same system, okay? And I think, so this paper is major. Um, 
first, I mean, you should know, I, I tell you, I, I, want, I want to tell you that uh, Peter Molnar, um, you see the name here, um, is, uh, has received recently the kind of the, no, you know, there is no Nobel Prize in geology. Sorry, guys. But uh, the, there is no Nobel Prize. There is the, um, how is it called? Oh, I forgot the name. The Crawford. Crawford Award. It's, it's, uh, we have our own award. Uh, we deliver our own uh, Nobel Prize. But it's really for people who have um, a massive um, contribution to, to, to the field. And so he's a, a recipient of this. And uh, yeah, he's considered uh, yeah, the, the, the one of the greatest, if not the greatest geologist. Uh, if you see my screen, I have a few papers by, by Molnar. I don't have, of course, I don't have them all. He has tons of papers. But um, his, his uh, contribution to science is, used, is huge and not I mean, this, this one paper that he did is very, very important, but it's not really his main field. Uh, yet, it, it became maybe a little bit more his main field, but he's, he's someone who is really broad at integrating different things. And, and this paper was really, I think, one of the starting point of tectonic geomorphology and, and a motivation for a lot of source to sink research because it shows how, uh, how it's necessary to understand the whole system and not just look at one aspect and one part of the system if you want to, to, to understand something about the history of the, of the Earth. Um, and so, and in particular, I think it really, he really put his, uh, his finger onto the problem of the sediment flux. You know, it's one of the main, uh, it's one of the main thing here, sediment, uh, sedimentation. Okay, and how can we interpret sedimentation? Uh, and there's so much still to 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 uh, to understand. So, so I think it's a very important paper. You you uh, I mean, these are the papers that I think in your in your career, uh, the, the, there is a few of those papers, uh, or actually there's many that you should keep, you know. Um, I can only advise you something, actually a little bit aside, is to start organizing your computer, your files, your directories. It's very important uh, to have good drawers uh, in which you can find your things. I use a soft a, a library manager, there are many. But uh, I also keep the papers as PDF. Uh, and there is no uh, ideal way of, of sorting. You know, uh, it's like everything. There is no ideal way of sorting out things because you're, you're never in the good drawer. But it's good to do it still because you, you can then uh, find your stuff. And so for your master, for instance, you're going to maybe soon start your research or maybe you started already. And I really advise you to have a folder which is called MSC Master Project, in which you will have a data folder in which you keep all your data. So your data might be a sample description. It might be a scan of your notebook. It might be uh, everything should be georeferenced, you know, latitude, longitude for your samples. Uh, it could be analysis, Excel tables. So, but you have a data folder. And then you have some, somewhere something where you have literature. So all the papers that you are going to at the end, so that you read and maybe you will at the end cite in your master. You should have them all in one place so that you can look at them. And of course, documents like figures is one folder. So all my master students, for instance, at the end of their master, uh, they give me something like this, for instance, I can show you. Um, uh, students, um, Andres, I have some archives, that's me keeping, but his master is like this. I don't know if you see, but there is Doné, Figure, GPS, all the pictures, and uh, some time scale creator that he did. Um, Charlotte, 
master is data, figures, and pictures. And here, the main document in doc and in PDF. In the data, there is just all the data arranged into Excel. All the GPS data, all the Paleomag, all the Rockeval, all the stable isotopes, all the XRD, all the XRF. In the figures, I have figure one to figure 25 and the table. And in the pictures, I have all the pictures where she went and even the movie is taken with the drone, I think. Okay, so this is, uh, this is quite good. Josh did the same, I think. Maybe it's a bit less organized, the analysis. Uh, yeah, but, but at least you have to try. Maybe the girls are better organized, I don't know. So, so, that's, uh, so, so, so that's important that you keep those papers and that you also identify which are the very important papers. You know, there is some, uh, it's like, you know, there is a lot of literature. If you want to pick up a novel in a library, you can pick up a novel, but there is only a few, uh, Victor Hugo and uh, Honoré de Balzac. And, you know, there is only a few great authors. So you have to be able to distinguish in your field, which one are the big guys, the big questions, the big, uh, the big papers and, and the, all of the rest of the literature. You know, you have some sort of ranking of hierarchy of papers. And actually in those kind of papers, uh, when I read this, I then look at the literature cited here. Okay, and this is only great papers. Actually, uh, there is Trumpy here with uh, Rudolf Trumpy. He's a very famous Swiss geologist. You have uh, Kenneth, uh, oh no, that's not the same shoe as I, as I thought, it's the same, I thought. Yeah, Richard Walcott, William Bull, William Hay, all of these are Davies, all of these are Dana, Lyell, all of these are just great, great, important papers. So, you know, by doing some genealogy, you go from one paper and you end up having a massive amount of things to read. But, um, you know, if you do that, you, that's the way you are going to increase your knowledge in your, in your master. That's really everything in, is into uh, reading all of this. Um, okay, so I think uh, I think we kind of uh, wrapped up, but I thought this was a really important thing to do is to to have a look at this paper. Um, do you have questions on that? No. No. We can no. In, your, in your in your report, you can maybe uh, put a few words about, about this paper. Um, PowerPoint. Okay, it goes this way. So, I go back here. Okay, so we finished on this before. And you see, uh, you see the sedimentology QS problem still? You guys see the this uh, QS problem slide? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So the the second, you remember we were in this uh, chapter, gains and limitation. And I said that I, I would talk maybe about the, mainly about the gains and the limitation, maybe we can uh, do at the end. Uh, but so there is the applied um, character, the applied aspect, and there is the earth system aspect. Um, and I wanted to speak, for instance, about this, uh, this uh, source to sink uh, basically, for me, doing source to sink uh, and looking at the sedimentary rocks, uh, I'm I'm a, a classic sedimentologist. Okay, I look at uh, sandstone, mudstone, uh, uh, but not carbonates. Um, 
but for me looking at these rocks is uh, because it's interesting to try to decrypt to understand what they tell us about the history of the earth and uh, we used to you know uh, not do that too much when we were looking at classic sedimentology. People used to study whether it's a delta or whether it's a beach and whether it's a shelf or, a, or turbidites and try to say the ratio between sand and mud and try to calculate volumes of reservoirs and connectivity because they, they could be good hydrocarbon reservoirs. Um, but in fact, we've uh, and, and paleoclimatology was more, was rather the field of carbonate sedimentologists or, uh, you know, the deep sea drilling sedimentologists. So people will go on, a, on those crews that I spoke about before, they will collect cores uh, in the deep ocean, far away from the continents. Those cores, they collect the rain of, of forearms and, 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 and very distal sediments very far away from the continents. And so they collect the isotopic composition of the, of the water, of the ocean. And so they have very good record of the past oceanic climate, basically, and that you can link with the earth climate. But in fact, when you think about the surfacing system, you realize that a clastic basin that collects sediments delivered from a mountain through a transfer system, system and all the way into the basin is also the integrated record of climate and tectonics in the source area. So there is a massive amount of information that is contained into clastic uh, sedimentary systems. Two, understand uh, the history of, of, uh, of the planet. Okay, so uh, one of the things we did at least in, in the group is to, um, to look at the PETM. And I'm sure uh, a lot of people uh, in, in Lausanne know about this because Thierry, I, I've worked a lot with Thierry Adat on this. Uh, Thierry has been working on the PETM since, uh, since a long time. And with me, he's been working more on, um, on the uh, cont continental and, and clastic aspects of this, and also in, uh, in proximal deltas, although he had data uh, from, from before. Um, and so we, uh, yeah, we had a, a paper published in a scientific report, and, and this, was, this had a lot of uh, resonance in, the, in, the, in small medias, but uh, for instance, in France, on, on France, in France Info, uh, the radio station, there was a little report about this. Uh, so basically, we could show by studying the sedimentary record of the PTM how uh, precipitation and flood intensity, magnitude, and recurrence had changed during the global warming of the PTM. Okay. And I think it's a very important step. The source to sink approach is a very important step because when I was a student, for instance, um, I did my PhD from 1999 to 2003. And when I was a PhD student, I was working on, on uh, Bartonian, pre uh sediments. So it's the Middle Eocene. And my supervisor never told me anything about the Middle Eocene climatic optimum, for instance. So all the climate events that we know have happened in the Cenozoic, they were studied, and it's normal that he didn't tell me because they were studied, they were, you know, they were the, 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 the study focus for paleoclimatologists, paleoceanographers. But now every sedimentary geologist who studies uh, sediments in the frame of source to sink should be aware of those ancient climate changes uh, because they all are super important on the delivery of sediment to basins and on the fabrication, manufacture of different types of grains, etc. You know, in a very hot climate, like in the early Eocene, you have a lot of rain, a lot of CO2 in the air, 
you surely weather your rocks very differently than in the Playo Pleistocene where it's all cold. Okay, so perhaps at this time you produce a lot of weathering material, a lot of clays perhaps. Okay, so there is a ton of new research questions linking climate with uh, clastic systems uh, that haven't been touched yet because climate was the, the reserved, the chasse gardée, uh, the reserved uh, domain of paleoceanographers, paleoclimatologists, isotope geochemists, isotope sedimentologists, uh, you know, analytical sedimentologists. Uh, voila. In fact, in fact, there is a lot to do still. Okay, I suggest a small break. Can I keep you then? Uh, we start again at 4.15. Okay. Okay. Merci. Okay. See you later.